talk about how we can apply these amazing um, technologies that have been described uh, by Patrick uh, for the working um, biologists uh, to, to tackle interesting questions. And for me, I want to focus both on using uh, genome editing technology to ask questions about uh, the regulatory uh, DNA uh, and also a vision of how genome editing tools could be applied uh, therapeutically. So before I get to that, I need to uh, give you a little bit of background into the clinical and biological uh, questions I'm interested in. Here's uh, a schema of hemoglobin, uh, which is a tetramer of two alpha and two beta globin chains, each with a heme moiety, which is the oxygen-carrying constituent uh, of red blood cells. And uh, disorders of the globin chains constitute the most common monogenic diseases in the world, and these include things like sickle cell disease as well as the thalassemia syndromes. And they affect uh, individuals whose ancestors occupied uh, the malarial endemic world, and it's anticipated just for sickle cell anemia there'll be uh, hundreds of thousands of newborns uh, born in the next 30 years. Uh, but this is a particular issue with uh, tens of millions uh, of infants anticipated uh, in Africa and South Asia over the coming decades. Really current uh, treatment options are very limited. Uh, these diseases are uh, simple in a sense. Uh, sickle cell disease is a substitution of beta globin and the thalassemia syndromes. Um, result from inadequate production of beta globin. Beta globin actually sits in a cluster of developmentally regulated genes. So these gamma globin genes are actually highly expressed during the fetal stage and um, serve as the constituents of fetal hemoglobin. And only after birth is gamma globin silenced, beta globin reciprocally activated, and finally adult hemoglobin is on and fetal hemoglobin is turned down to a very low level. So um, patients with the beta globin disorders are actually born healthy and only develop a disease during the first year of life. There's abundant uh, genetic, biochemical, and epidemiologic data that indicates that fetal hemoglobin can ameliorate these uh, beta globin disorders. So for example, in uh, this study, a large cohort of individuals with sickle cell disease, the quartile uh, with the highest level of fetal hemoglobin had significantly extended um, overall survival. So it's remained a major um, imperative for hematologists to understand how it is that fetal hemoglobin is regulated and how we could reinduce fetal hemoglobin to benefit these patients. Um, normally, uh, fetal hemoglobin is uh, at a very low level, less than 1%, and there's very rare cells, so-called F cells, that have measurable amounts of fetal hemoglobin. There are rare conditions called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin where all the cells have um, measurable fetal hemoglobin, and this would really be uh, the desirable state for a patient with a beta globin disorder. And then there's intermediate conditions of elevated fetal hemoglobin um, where there's a marginal increase in the percentage of fetal hemoglobin and a subset of the cells that uh, have measurable fetal hemoglobin and would be protected in the case of a hemoglobin disorder. So from twin studies, we know that the regulation of fetal hemoglobin is largely genetic. Um, and we know from rare individuals uh, and patients with elevated fetal hemoglobin, some of what regulates fetal hemoglobin uh, is variation at the beta globin cluster itself. And there have been informative mutants, including uh, individuals who carry a, a deletion in this region called the Corfu deletion, who have 100% fetal hemoglobin. And these studies suggest that sequences at this cluster recruit complexes that repress fetal hemoglobin. But the nature of these factors that repress fetal hemoglobin has really remained essentially a black box um, for the last 50 years. And that uh, changed with the advent of genome-wide association studies. So these are studies that take advantage of having a sequencing of the human genome, appreciation of common genetic variation and its co-inheritance on haplotypes 
to do case control studies where individuals with a trait or disease can be compared um, to unaffected individuals by uh, genotyping DNA and many hundreds of thousands of single nucleotide polymorphisms to identify variants associated with the trait or disease. And these are kind of the typical um, results of a GWAS study. On the x-axis are all the SNPs positioned along the genome, and on the y-axis, the statistical significance. And this is um, referred to as a Manhattan plot because these uh, loci with um, uh, significant trait associations rise from the horizon somewhat like uh, skyscrapers. But the results of these studies often find many loci uh, with trait associations, and the cumulative um, variance of that trait explained by all the loci is often quite small. So moving from a, a GWAS study to an understanding of a biological process has remained a major challenge. The GWAS of fetal hemoglobin is somewhat of an exception to this rule. Uh, the GWAS were quite striking and reproducible across uh, cohorts of various ethnic backgrounds. Just three loci contributed at least half the variation in uh, fetal hemoglobin level. And these include variants at the beta globin cluster itself, which made sense, as well as this other locus, HBS1L-MIB, which had been implicated by familial studies. But this novel locus uh, on chromosome 2, B11A, um, really stood out above the others. It was a bit like the Empire State Building on this Manhattan plot. And so work uh, in the laboratory of my uh, research mentor, Stuart Orkin, uh, along with others, has unambiguously validated that B11A is a repressor of fetal hemoglobin. For example, in this study, uh, a mouse model of sickle cell disease is crossed to uh, a mouse with conditional knockout of B11A in the erythroid lineage to uh, create a double knockout mouse. And you can see in this double knockout a disappearance of the characteristic sickle cell forms and a pancellular induction of fetal hemoglobin and a reversal of both the hematologic and pathologic manifestations of disease. And additional work has identified that this factor, B11A, is a zinc finger transcriptional repressor which occupies the beta globin cluster. It partic participates in complexes um, with other uh, chromatin modifying uh, and DNA binding factors. However, none of these other associated factors in the network seem to have either the potency or specificity oops, of B11A in repressing fetal hemoglobin. So B11A has emerged as this exciting rational therapeutic target for reinduction of fetal hemoglobin for the beta globin disorders. Um, but there's a, a bit of a paradox here. B11A deficiency actually results in um, perinatal lethality, and B11A is known to play important roles outside of the erythroid lineage, including in neuron and B lymphocyte development. In spite of this, the genetic variation of B11A is very common. It's well tolerated. It's associated with increased fetal hemoglobin level and amelioration of the beta globin disorders. So this led us to hypothesize that this fetal hemoglobin associated genetic variation must influence the cell type specific regulation of B11A. And um, just uh, um, to mention, as many of you know, uh, the number of genes across organisms doesn't differ that much, but the, the non-coding genome is a site of dramatic variation. And in humans, uh, uh, up to 99% of the genome is not involved in coding for genes. And then uh, increasingly it's appreciated uh, the dynamic um, and sometimes heritable epigenetic uh, decoration of the non-coding genome. Uh, and its annotation in functional classes, such as enhancers, which are distal regulators that can promote uh, gene expression in part through looping physical interactions with promoters to recruit um, the transcriptional machinery. And one of the critical features of enhancers <coughs> is that there may be multiple enhancers for a given gene, so that in one cell type, Certain enhancers may activate the gene, and in another cell type, an altogether different set of enhancers may activate the gene. And this uh, is, uh, may help explain some of the um, variation in gene expression, both across organisms and between individuals. 
All right, so back to B11A. Here's a map of the B11A gene transcribed from right to left. And you can see in this large second intron, more than uh, 50 KB away from the promoter of B11A, reside these variants that have been associated with fetal hemoglobin level. Um, so to get it, the potential of uh, these variants to influence the regulation of B11A, we used uh, an assay DNase1 sensitivity, which is a measure of open chromatin with regulatory potential. And in erythroid cells, we observed DNase1 sensitivity peaks at this region of uh, intronic sequence that contained the trait associated variants. And zooming in, we observed three discrete hypersensitive sites uh, labeled here 55, 58, and 62 based on their distance in uh, kilobases from the transcription start site, each of which has overlying trait associated variants. And in other tissues which express high levels of B11A, such as brain and B lymphocytes, there was a paucity of hypersensitivity at this region, uh, suggesting a lineage specific regulatory potential. We uh, went back to the original uh, cohorts in which the GWAS had been done and did fine mapping. And I'll summarize that to say we identified a variant um, that was directly within this plus 62 hypersensitive site that had the strongest, most significant uh, association to the phenotype. And when we went back to the uh, original GWAS, there were six studies that had identified four sentinel SNFs as being most highly associated with the trait, one of which was this variant within the hypersensitive site, and then three others that intervened between two hypersensitive sites. We found the strongest trait association was in this uh, variant within the hypersensitive site. When we did conditional analysis, we found when we controlled uh, for the association with these uh, variants not in the hypersensitive site, we retained a significant association with this uh, hypersensitive site associated variant. But when we uh, conditioned on the variant directly within the hypersensitive site, we lost association with the other variants. So it suggests that the variant directly within um, the regulatory DNA fully accounted for the previously described uh, trait associations. This variant um, resides within um, a sequence motif that mimics this um, half EBOX GATA um, motif that's been retrieved by uh, CHIP-seq studies as highly occupied by uh, GATA1, TAL1 transcriptional complexes in erythroid cells. And the high fetal hemoglobin uh, variant T is disruptive of the motif. We used um, allele-specific uh, chromatin analysis to investigate the impact of this variant on the ability of these transcription factors uh, to occupy chromatin using um, primary uh, human donors who are heterozygous for one high F and one low F allele. And we found that in the input chromatin there was an equal binding the, uh, um, an equal retrieval of alleles, but in the chromatin precipitated by either GATA1 or TAL1 complexes, we saw uh, increased occupancy of the low F um, associated allele, suggesting that the impact of this variant is to modestly reduce binding of these critical erythroid transcription factors. Moreover, there's a synonymous uh, variant in exon 4 of B11A which in doubly heterozygous individuals can serve as a tracer of enhancer genotype. And so using allele-specific RNA expression um, from donors who are doubly heterozygous, we were able to show increased expression of BC11A from this uh, low F associated uh, enhancer um, allele. So it suggests that the trait associated variant is modestly, um, it's disrupting the motif, it's modestly reducing binding of these critical erythroid factors and reducing expression uh, of B11A. To test the functional potential of these sequences, we started using these traditional ectopic reporter assays. And when we cloned sequences um, containing each of the hypersensitive site and the traits associated uh, variants, we found that these sequences could um, uh, enhance gene expression um, in the mid-gestation um, mouse fetal liver, which is the site of 
the onset of adult stage erythropoiesis. Even within the hematopoietic compartment, I had mentioned that B. sylvanae is very highly expressed in B. lymphocytes. In fact, this is about tenfold higher than in erythroid cells. But this um, enhancer was only able to drive expression in the erythroid cells and not in the B cells. So at this point, we were able to show that this enhancer was uh, sufficient uh, to drive B cell DNA expression, but we really wanted to know, was it necessary? Was it, was this, were these sequences uh, driving B cell DNA expression uh, in the steady state? And to do that, we had to turn to uh, genome editing. And so um, Patrick had nicely introduced, I think, all three of these modalities, uh, zinc finger nucleases, uh, tau effector nucleases, and CRISPR-associated nucleases, so I won't belabor that. Uh, but I wanted to um, uh, just mention some of the outcomes of uh, genome editing as pertains to the molecular biologist. So a single cleavage, uh, as Patrick indicated, predominantly will um, result in non-homologous end joining with uh, production of these small insertion deletions. Um, with a, a donor um, sequence, there can be homology-directed repair with uh, replacement of a specific sequence. But an alternative strategy is to um, use multiple um, guides to create two double-strand breaks uh, to result in a deletion of the intervening sequence. And I wanted to uh, consider that strategy a little bit and what some of the advantages of uh, using deletions as opposed to uh, single um, disruptions could be. So here's kind of a schematic of just a, a generic uh, gene locus, and these um, vertical lines are to indicate sites of cleavage. And so one benefit of a deletion is actually uh, ease of detection of the deletion event by conventional PCR, because you could imagine uh, primers uh, spanning the deletion site would give a unique band indicative of uh, um, deletion. Uh, I think perhaps more importantly, this strategy um, could ensure a loss of function allele. Uh, as compared to um, a cleavage at an exon, which could result in small insertions of de in deletions, it would be anticipated in that case one out of three events would remain in frame uh, and could give a functional um, protein. And then even some of the nonsense mutations could uh, escape nonsense mediated decay and result in either hypomorphic or neomorphic phenotypes. If one targets um, multiple exons uh, for deletion, one could imagine in the case of detecting a deletion on just one allele that the other allele has likely been cleaved at one or both of these exons and may uh, still be disrupted. So deletion detection may enrich uh, for fully disrupted uh, cells. That by deleting specific exons, you could get isoform uh, specific disruptions. But what I really think um, is the utility of deletions is for interrogating uh, the non-coding or regulatory genome, because there's no obvious way using uh, single disruptions to um, impair uh, regulatory elements, particularly elements um, of unknown uh, function. And so for, in this case, uh, one could imagine an intronic element that could be deleted um, and interrogated. I think one uh, salient question um, that you're probably all wondering is about off-target effects. Um, one thing we know about off-target effects is they tend to be uh, sequence-specific, um, as Patrick showed. And so uh, a kind of a simple approach for the biologist is just to use multiple uh, guide sequences to make multiple on-target um, disruptions and then ensuring that those um, uh, mutants have the same phenotype. Uh, I think that's a quite um, reliable way to assess for on-target activity. So in, in the case of a deletion, you might have an A and a B that delete um, in one sequence and then an adjacent but non-overlapping a2 and B2, uh, and you can even use the uh, same primer strategies to detect uh, both deletions. So I just want to show a little bit of data about how we've used this deletion strategy to make um, 
uh, disruptions in cell lines. And so our approach has been to electroporate uh, plasmids um, expressing both um, Cas9 and, and single guide RNAs to an A and a B site to make a deletion and co-express um, a GFP um, expression construct. We sort uh, the most highly GFP expressing cells after several days and then plate at limiting dilution and screen clones uh, by PCR. And we've done this now for about approaching 2,000 clones and 17 loci ranging from 1 KB to 1 megabase in size. Um, and I, there's a couple of interesting points here. When you calculate uh, the deletion frequency and then um, apply like a, um, a Hardy-Weinberg distribution, you actually um, observe fewer than expected uh, monoallelic deletions and more than ex uh, expected biallelic deletions, uh, suggesting um, that this system is actually quite suitable for the uh, production of biallelic uh, disruption. That the outcomes uh, tend to be um, predicted deletions with very small, um, usually one to 10 base pair deletions uh, at the predicted deletion junction, and that alleles that are not deleted are often uh, scarred um, with uh, small uh, indels at the uh, recognition site. Not on this slide, we also see relatively frequent um, inversions. There is a relationship between the um, size of the deletion and the frequency of the event. Uh, that's inverse, so that for smaller deletions we see a higher frequency, but even up to one megabase we're able to detect uh, deleted clones. Okay, so back to B11A. Um, in this case, we had identified an intronic um, enhancer that carried trait associated variants, that this enhancer was sufficient to drive erythroid specific. Uh, gene expression, but we wanted to ask, was this necessary? So we used this genome editing deletion approach to remove this enhancer, identify clones that had biallelic deletion, and measure B11A expression. And here's three uh, um, such erythroid clones. And we saw a dramatic loss of B11A expression at the RNA level. It was essentially undetectable at the protein level. So it suggests that this enhancer was absolutely required for B11A expression. Not surprisingly, since B11A is a repressor of embryonic and fetal globin genes, in the absence of B11A, we saw a dramatic uh, upregulation of endogenous uh, embryonic globin genes. In contrast, when we made the same biallelic intronic disruption to B lymphoid cells that express high levels of B11A, there was no impact on expression at the RNA or protein level. So it suggests that although this enhancer is absolutely required for B11A expression in erythroid cells, it's dispensable in a non-erythroid context. Um, we subsequently uh, dug into this uh, composite enhancer and I found that Although there's a sequence homology to each of these three human hypersensitive sites, there's only a DNA sensitivity in the mouse lineage at two of the three sites, so there's already some functional divergence. And so we um, deleted each of these three individual hypersensitive sites as compared to the entire composite enhancer region. Uh, not surprisingly, the uh, site that was not hypersensitive had no impact on B11A expression when deleted. But to our surprise, this 55 site had really minimal impact on B11A or globin expression, but deletion of this 62 site had um, complete effect mimicking deleting the composite enhancer in terms of loss of B11A and induction of embryonic globin. So these results help I indicate that although the um, biochemical epigenetic marks have some predictive value, that um, Genome editing can reveal um, further functional significance with some elements uh, being essential and other elements being dispensable. In fact, as I indicated, there's divergence between mouse and human at this enhancer, that the human has three hypersensitive sites. Each of these hypersensitive sites is occupied by these critical erythroid transcription factors, GATA1 and TAL1. And when we did um, a series of transgenics containing either the entire 
composite enhancer or one or two of the hypersensitive sites, we found that actually just this core 58 human site uh, was sufficient to drive erythroid specific uh, enhancer activity. So these results uh, also indicate within the regulatory DNA there appears to be uh, functional divergence between mouse and human, whereas in the mouse enhancer the 62 site is essential, but in the human this 58 site, which isn't even hypersensitive in the mouse, is sufficient for activity. And it's tempting to speculate that this um, divergence at the B-cell-11A enhancer, critical repressor of fetal hemoglobin, may underlie some of the differences in globin gene expression between uh, human and mouse. Um, so that in the human system, there's actually two switches. There's an embryonic stage followed by a fetal stage followed by an adult stage. And in the mouse system, there's only two stages, an embryonic and an adult stage. And perhaps uh, divergence in regulation of B-11A may contribute to this species differences. So to summarize, um, uh, we've identified through GWAS um, and uh, genetic fine mapping, epigenetic um, studies, and genome editing, an intronic uh, uh, erythroid enhancer of B-11A that promotes expression of B-11A, which in turn is a repressor of uh, fetal globin genes leading to low fetal hemoglobin, um, expression of um, adult hemoglobin, setting up a situation permissive for uh, beta globin disorders such as sickle cell disease. That the role of these uh, natural polymorphisms that are associated uh, with um, reduced binding of transcription factors, reduced production of B-cell A, uh, derepression of fetal hemoglobin, and mild amelioration of disease. But when we do um, a more robust disruption, such as deletion of the enhancer, we can see an absolute loss of B-sylvanae, and we would predict even um, more induction of fetal hemoglobin and potentially even um, a curative uh, outcome for the globin disorders. I, I just want to briefly um, put these results into context. There's been um, a convergence in recent years of genetics and epigenetics, and whereas the initial um, uh, findings of GWAS were interpreted somewhat pessimistically that the vast majority of variants associated with human traits and disease uh, reside in the non-coding genome and seemed kind of uh, intractable and beyond our understanding. Um, in the last couple of years, it, it's been appreciated that these variants aren't randomly distributed, but are actually highly enriched in DNA hypersensitive sites um, and uh, fall preferentially in the regulatory genome. And not just in the regulatory genome, but in the cell type appropriate regulatory genome. So for example, variants that are associated with QRS duration, which is a measure of cardiac uh, electrophysiologic activity are associated uh, enriched in heart-specific enhancers, but not in enhancers of other tissues. Variants associated with ulcerative colitis are enriched in colonic enhancers, but not in enhancers of other tissues. Variants associated with Alzheimer's disease are enriched in brain-specific enhancers, but not enhancers of other tissues. So I think um, the emerging data suggests that cell type specific enhancer variation may be uh, a widespread mechanism that underpins uh, phenotypic diversity, disease susceptibility. But functional evidence for this is really lacking. And the erythroid enhancer variation of B11A is one example with functional validation, but I think it remains to be seen if that's more the exception um, or the rule. And I'm just, I'll just describe briefly one approach I'm taking to get at this, there's been very good genetics of erythroid traits, and there's 75 high confidence loci that are associated with erythroid traits. If, uh, we, when I compare this genetic map to the epigenetic maps that we've created, looking at primary human uh, erythroid precursor enhancers, see dramatic overlap between these uh, erythroid associated variants and erythroid enhancers, with more than half of loci having a variant directly overlapping an erythroid enhancer. And this is much more that are found for uh, control enhancers or control variants. 
So it suggests a, a set of candidate loci that have erythroid enhancers that we now hypothesize underlie the trait association. And I think this will be a challenge moving forward to apply genome editing tools to uh, uh, identify what are really the causal enhancers and the causal variants underlying uh, not just erythroid traits, but many uh, traits and disease susceptibilities. And then finally, I want to touch on um, the therapeutic potential of these findings. So as I had mentioned, uh, the idea is that deletion of this B cell A enhancer might lead to loss of expression of B cell A, derepression of fetal hemoglobin, potentially um, curative outcome for the beta globin disorders, but spare B cell A in uh, non-erythroid tissues such as B lymphocytes, where it plays a critical role. So the vision is to, co to collect hematopoietic stem cells from patients with beta globin disorders. To ex vivo, introduce these sequence specific nucleases to disrupt the B cell DNA enhancer, and then to reinfuse those cells uh, back into the patient. And the benefits of this would include loss of B cell DNA expression in uh, the red blood cell precursors to induce fetal hemoglobin, while sparing B cell DNA in non erythroid lineages, including B lymphocytes and other uh, hematopoietic lineages that rely on B cell DNA that the modification would be permanent and profound so that the expression of the nucleases could be uh, quite transient, and that um, would take advantage of the known survival advantage of um, both erythroid precursors and mature erythrocytes with elevated fetal hemoglobin. So even if only a, a fraction of the stem cells were modified, they would give rise to um, an erythroid um, daughter population that would carry a survival advantage and would be expected to result in um, substantial patient benefit. Compared um, to other gene therapy approaches, there's no obligate uh, random insertional mutagenesis, and there's no need for uh, lifelong expression of foreign sequences, which relies on um, heterologous regulatory elements that can either be silenced or can cause aberrant gene regulation. So the risks, I think, include um, off-target genetic modification, um, as well as intrinsic risks to hematopoietic stem cell transplant, the preparation or so-called conditioning therapy, which could be modified uh, depending on the intensity of such therapy. So I think one question is, is this uh, a feasible approach? Uh, and I wanted to share some recent data to suggest it is uh, quite feasible with existing technologies. Um, this is data um, of Sangamo Biosciences that they presented at this year's uh, American Society of Hematology meeting, where they were able to um, isolate the CD34 hematopoietic stem progenitor cell population from healthy donors and using um, kind of clinical grade, good manufacturing practice and at a clinical scale, meaning hundreds of millions of these cells, ex vivo use uh, mRNA electroporation to introduce zinc finger nucleases and uh, demonstrate editing of a target site at up to 80% uh, allele frequency. So uh, that's clearly exceeding um, a, a threshold that would be required to disrupt B cell of an A to uh, have um, a therapeutic benefit. Uh, in the last month, there's been a report of um, a zinc finger nuclease uh, gene editing uh, clinical trial where they disrupted the CCR5 um, HIV co-receptor um, in uh, autologous T cells of individuals with HIV infection, and they were able to show um, efficacy in terms of editing, um, durability uh, in terms of uh, maintaining edited cells uh, for um, uh, close to a year, safety, um, and hints of uh, viral control. So I think the fundamental question for therapeutic genome editing is what's the safety? Um, and so as Patrick uh, mentioned that, you know, um, many of the off-target sites are predictable based on um, sequence match or relative mismatch, and that um, uh, by designing uh, guides uh, to minimize uh, potential um, 
uh, matches, one can uh, reduce the uh, frequency of off-target effects that with technological advances like double nicking or short guides or other strategies, one might also be able to reduce. But I think uh, this has to be put into the context of the therapeutic vision, which is uh, to deliver hundreds of millions of um, modified cells to patients, and that um, uh, the knowledge that, in theory at least, one allele in those hundreds of millions, um, if uh, modified in a dangerous way, could cause a deleterious outcome. Um, so the, this is essentially an unmeasurable problem because the sequencing depth to get at um, one in 100 million is, is you know, not technically possible, at least today. Um, and even if one could uh, um, define off-target effects throughout the genome, most of them would be very difficult uh, to interpret. I think um, as a clinician, one has to uh, emphasize the clinical uh, and biological outcomes and uh, thoroughly analyze what are the effects of editing cells with specific reagents in terms of the uh, biological uh, potential uh, of those cells. I think furthermore, uh, one has to put this in context of the uh, risk of a patient's underlying disease as well as alternative approaches which often include uh, either viral gene therapy with known insertional mutagenesis, uh, uh, alkylating therapy which can cause uh, known DNA damage, and you know, even an appreciation of normal somatic mutation through life through various genotoxic exposures. Um, but this is an important area for future study. So in summary, I've described this fetal hemoglobin-associated common genetic variation at an enhancer of B7A, erythroid enhancer, how one can apply genome editing to reveal that such an enhancer may be necessary for expression in one lineage but dispensable in another lineage, um, how uh, deletion production by genome editing can be a powerful tool for the biologist, particularly for the study of regulatory DNA, that these cell type specific regulatory elements seem to be really frequent substrates for um, phenotypic diversity and trait associated variation, and that the B cell of an erythroid enhancer is an exciting uh, target for therapeutic genome editing. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, my um, uh, research mentor, Stuart Orkin, um, as well as Jan Zhu, a postdoc in Stu's lab who I collaborated with on the epigenetic mapping studies, and Matt Canver, uh, a graduate student who I collaborated with um, on the deletion analyses, uh, as well as collaborators including um, Guillaume Lettre in Montreal, a geneticist who helped with the fine mapping, Matt Porteous at Stanford who um, helped prompt some of the initial talon deletion experiments, and John Stamm at University of Washington for the DNA swan sensitivity. Um, funding sources include NIDDK and Doris Duke. Uh, I'm starting um, an independent uh, position in coming months at Boston Children's, and I'm um, uh, always looking for talented uh, people who are interested in genome editing. So with that, thank you for your attention.